Good afternoon. I'm Danielle Conway. You're watching Life in the Law and the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. Today's topic is Japan's Constitution in the 21st Century, and I'm here with Professor Mark Levin from the William S. Richardson School of Law. He is a Japan expert, and also our guest today is Professor Lawrence Repetta, and he is a professor at Meiji University in Tokyo. Welcome. Glad Thank you, Danielle. So you're visiting from Japan. You've only been here three days. You're passing through. You're on break from school. And what are you teaching in Japan? Well, I teach um, several courses. My students are undergraduates. Uh, and they tend to be um, kids who have a strong interest in international matters and have some degree of English ability and have lots of enthusiasm. How many students are you teaching there? Oh, you know, in my typical class, I'll have 15 to 20 students. Fantastic. And Professor Mark Levin, you are our Japan expert here at the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law. Thank you for joining us, too. And my typical class will have 15 or 20 <laughs> students, too. <laughs> exactly. So what courses are you teaching this semester, Mark? This semester, I've got international business transactions and the second year SEM class, seminar class, where the students are writing research papers and six of my ten are writing papers on Japan topics. And so Larry came to your class and talked to a couple of your students about the topics they were writing about. And wonderfully, my students gave presentations and Larry heard them and then gave them feedback. So it was really rich for them. So Larry, you have had a storied legal career. <laughs> How did it start? Wow, well it was a long time ago. I went, um, I studied at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I took my first job in Tokyo, actually, after graduation at a commercial law firm in Tokyo. Excellent. What did you practice there? Well, it was uh, international business. We represented Japanese companies that had uh, you know, operations abroad and foreign companies want to do business in Japan. So business may be the thing that you practice, but what's your passion? Well, I, I didn't continue that practice for too long. I, I really uh, wanted to do some research and study Japanese law, uh, in particular constitutional issues. And that's what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> so I really want to get into it because we see some shifts that may be occurring on the horizon with Japan's constitution. What's the lay of the land now uh, before these shifts seem to appear and what is likely to happen in the near future? Well clearly uh, the big turning point uh, took place a little over a year ago uh, in elections held in December of 2012. Uh, with those elections, the current Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, uh, took office. And he's a very vigorous, strong Prime Minister with a very clear agenda. And that is a very diplomatic way of saying he's his own person and he has his own agenda. And what's that agenda? Let's get into it. Well, um, Prime Minister Abe is clearly a, a very nationalistic figure. and. Um, his mission, uh, as, as he has said many times, uh, is really to change Japan's democratic constitution and replace it with fundamentally a different system. So as I understand Japan's constitution now, it is leading with principles based in individual rights. So where does the prime minister stand on the promotion of individual rights? That's right. So the current constitution, um, was drafted in the 1940s and after the war and it clearly uh, declares strong protection for individual rights it's uh, it's based on popular sovereignty uh, and you know would be very recognizable to people in the United States or Western Europe as a strong uh, bulwark to protect individual rights um, Prime Minister Abe uh, his grandfather who was a prime minister during the 1950s uh, and many of Japan's nationalistic leaders want to change that system. And what they really want to do is reinstitute uh, a constitutional system which was very similar to what existed uh, before the war. Now, Mark, what do you say are some of the reasons for the desire to change that system? You lived in Japan, actually, and you also taught law in Japan many years. Well, you know, we go back to the idea of what a constitution is. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, a constitution constitutes the state. The mm -hmm. verb is inside the noun. Mm -hmm. And it is the defining document that sets up what is the relationship between the people of the nation and the nation itself. And who runs it? 
And who will the people of the nation be running the nation? Or will the nation come from some other direction, such as in the previous constitution of Japan, the emperor? So the people of Japan were not the subjects. Uh, well, they were the subjects of the emperor. But the state itself, the sovereignty of the state, was with the emperor. Now, in Prime Minister Abe's proposals, he finesses that so as those things will stay on. But the basic shift would change the weight so that the state would be the dominant force and the people would be there to essentially accomplish the state's purposes. So a great deal of freedom and the respect for the individual would be lost. If you were a betting man, what would you say the chances of the shift being successful? Well, I'm not a betting man, but um, to change the Constitution it really requires uh, leaping a high hurdle. In Japan's case, um, the proposals for change must uh, have two-thirds votes in favor in both houses of uh, the parliament. In, this, in the United States case, it would require two-thirds votes in both houses of Congress and then approval by three-fourths of the states. So it's, it's very difficult to change the Constitution. Uh, in the near term, it does not appear that uh, Prime Minister Abe can achieve that. However, he can clearly achieve many of his objectives by passing legislation that will cover some of the same ground. Mm -hmm. So one example is that just a month and a half ago, in early December, we saw the Japanese parliament pass a, a new state secrecy law, which grants government agencies broad authority to designate information as secret and imposes uh, potentially very severe criminal penalties on any government official who may leak information to a news reporter or to a law professor or to anyone else. Now that's a little different than what we're dealing with today in the United States with the Snowden effect. So we're actually talking about in Japan protecting government secrets from disclosure. But disclosure might mean an informed populace. It might mean informed individuals such that they know what their government is doing. Are those the concerns that are raised by this potential legislation? Yes, and so that's, you've you put your finger on the fundamental question, whether you're in the United States or Japan or elsewhere, which is what is the balance? Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line uh, between information that should be kept secret and information that should be available to the people? Another question mm -hmm. is whether or not there would be punishments put not so much on the people who disclose, mm -hmm. that's one set of issues that are themselves complicated, but what would happen when the media gets that information? Are they free to publish it under their protections for the press, or could they too be published for publishing what has come into their hands? And one of the dangers of this new law is just that, that it, would, it has provisions that could potentially put media into the criminal eye as well. Now let's not assume that everybody knows the importance of the media being uh, given access to government information. So let's start with some basic rationales why me the media should be aware of what the government is doing, why individuals should be concerned about media outlets having that type of information. Well, our constitutional system of popular sovereignty means that the people hold the ultimate authority uh, in constituting the government and in making fundamental decisions. And of course, the people can only make intelligent decisions if they have access to information. Mm -hmm. uh, and for nearly all of us, the primary source of information is the news media. So we, we all rely on newspapers and television and, un, and other media sources for most of our knowledge of what the government's doing. And even though we rely upon media sources, unlike this show that actually runs on a network meant to be viewed by everyone, many media outlets are conglomerates and they have relationships with the government, in fact. And in Japan has a, has a national broadcasting agency. The, many people in the United States are familiar with the BBC in the UK. Well, Japan has a comparable NHK. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that happened in the past year was that the 
Prime Minister was enabled to appoint close friends to be on the governing board of NHK, and they selected a new director. Now, he's in the spotlight. He may well be stepping down for some scandalous things he said, but in essence, he tipped his hand by showing his right-wing leanings mm -hmm. uh, quite clearly. Had he not done that, I think he'd simply be able to operate that within the institution. And that's the two-pronged approach you're talking about with changing the, the structure of the constitutional democracy. I'll try changing the Constitution, but if that doesn't work, I'll work this other, this other avenue, which is changing legislation or appointing cronies to important media positions. Well, I think that's also a pawn, pawn game towards constitutional revision. Mm -hmm. So constitutional revision is very difficult. He's going to have to get parliamentary support and popular support. But you move the pieces across the board slowly by shaping the media in your direction, creating a government secrecy law getting these other laws in place that may help create a climate so that five years down the road, six years down the road, then when a constitutional provision for change comes through, it may be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite anxious about what the prospects may be. So this is much more strategic in the perspective of going one avenue or another. It's a man who's They're trying to work out his grandfather's mission. I think it's very strategic. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So can we get back to the secrecy? I want to talk about some of your efforts in trying to promote information within uh, media outlets and also information going to individuals for their own protection against government? Well, I've, uh, when I graduated from law school and I, I moved to Japan uh, in the early 80s, um, I met some Japanese lawyers and professors who were very interested in the American Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, at the time, I didn't know anything about the <laughs> American Freedom of Information Act, but they started telling me about it, uh, and they launched a movement in Japan for Japan to adopt a similar law, um, and it did. And so that law came into effect in 2001, uh, and it does provide a right for anyone to request government agencies to disclose information uh, that they may be interested in. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we've had this law in place now for over 40 years. Uh, and it, you know, it is one of the foundations of our kind of government in which anyone uh, has a right to demand some accountability, to demand information, to learn about what, uh, how the government is exercising its power. Mm -hmm. Its authority and the processes which it undertakes. And, th and that's important for an informed democracy. So let me ask about the informed democracy in Japan. Are they aware of some of these potential shifts and this strategy of constitutional change that Abe is undertaking? Well, we we've just saw uh, in autumn of last year a tremendous outpouring of um, you know, activism, uh, public demonstrations by thousands of people, um, daily uh, articles in, 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 liberal, in liberal newspapers attacking uh, this proposed secrecy bill. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it really grants the government broad power to designate information as secret and beyond access mm -hmm. uh, to the people. And there was a big reaction in Japan. Not big enough to stop the law, but clearly many, many people became very concerned. Well, when we come back from our break, I want to talk about the culture in Japan and why that activism actually is fairly extraordinary. So this is Danielle Conway. You're watching Life in the Law on the ThinkTech Live Network streaming series. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Welcome back. This is Danielle Conway. You're watching Life in the Law on the ThinkTech Live Network streaming series. 
My guests are Professor Mark Levin from the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law, a Japan, a Japan expert, and Professor Lawrence Rapetta, who is a law professor at Meiji University in Tokyo. We're talking about Japan's constitution in the 21st century. So we left off the last segment talking about activism in Japan. Is that extraordinary considering the wealth and the culture of Japan? Can you give some insights on that? Yes, I, it, there's been a big change in recent years. Um, there were massive street demonstrations and participation by you know, large numbers of people in public demonstrations back in the 1960s and the 1970s, the, the Vietnam War years, um, that, that era. Since then, um, we've seen very little in the way of large public demonstrations. Japan is a wealthy country. Most people enjoy quite a comfortable standard of living, so there's a great deal of satisfaction with those basic uh, daily life issues. Mm -hmm. We saw a change, however, with the great earthquake and tsunami disaster of 2011. Mm -hmm. So since then, we've seen continuous large-scale demonstrations in opposition to uh, nuclear power. Uh, we saw that, and those, those demonstrations continue. In, uh, in 2013, then, we also saw some very large street demonstrations against the secrecy bill. Okay. So with the nuclear power bill, did you tell me that there were about 54 uh, That's right. plants yeah. or reactors there? That's right. From the 1970s um, until the disaster occurred, uh, Japan constructed 54 nuclear power plants, mm -hmm. and all of them are located around the uh, the coastlines. Mm -hmm. because Japan, of course, is an island country. Nuclear power plants need lots of water for cooling, so naturally they were built along the coastlines. So what's the political significance of that buildup, and what implications did it have for the government at the time that was in power? Well, the um, electrical power industry uh, is the source of great wealth and tremendous political influence. Um, so there was a very close relationship between uh, the, big, the big power producers, the companies that developed in technology and built the plants, uh, and uh, mainstream uh, conservative politicians. Uh, in fact, they actually used the phrase, the nuclear power village, mm -hmm. um, to describe this sort of incestuous relationship between these large government, uh, between these large business organizations mm -hmm and government figures. So that came to a screeching halt with this horrible uh, disaster. Um, the earthquake that happened in March of 2011 and the tsunami, which many of you may remember, mm -hmm. um, caused three nuclear meltdowns. Mm -hmm. And those, uh, those three plants, which are about, I think, about 150 miles north of Tokyo, are still not under control. They're uh, contaminated water is continually flowing into the ground and into the ocean from those three uh, reactors. So those are some of the environmental impacts, but Mark, can you talk to us about what that actually means in terms of the government that was impacted by those Well, I, th I think what this does, first I want to repeat a point that Larry said, mm -hmm. which is many people may be surprised with the level of activism, citizen activism that's being seen in Japan today, mm -hmm. but this is not unprecedented. Uh, Japanese people can and do and will protest, and back in the late 50s, the early 1960s, into the 70s, Japan was a, a bubbling with uh, citizen democracy, and maybe that's what the protectors of the status quo are worried about, because mm -hmm. they know that that potential is there. Another thing about the, the nuclear meltdowns was the connection to what we were talking about earlier, information and closed information. So, you know, if there's a fire, if there's a forest fire, you can see the smoke in the air, That's you've right. got it. But releases of radiation are terrifying in part because there's no way you can know what's happening except for scientific information that's made available to you. And the public were very anxious, and justifiably so, that the information was not being provided to them. And I think this brings back the themes of what we're talking about today because these issues of information become so central to public safety and public health. 
Well, I think there were some news reports at the time where the Japanese government was really unwilling to put out information because they didn't want everyone to know how bad it was. Many people were getting information from U.S. sources, somewhat similar to what you see with pollution in Beijing. Mm -hmm. it, the U.S. Embassy is becoming the source of information, which is tragic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that shouldn't be the case. Exactly. So what are some of the measures you think, besides activism, that can occur in order to improve information getting into the hands of individuals and into the hands of media outlets? You know, there's no easy answer. I think a uh, you know, democratic form of government is really a difficult operation to push forward. It requires efforts by lots and lots of people to speak up, to ask questions, to demand information. Um, so um, it, it, it's a long, it's a long-term project. And what are what are our roles as lawyers in this particular process, particularly those that you train? Sure, you know, the role of law schools uh, and law professors is critical just to make sure that we have uh, you know, a cadre of, of professionals who are available to, to explain issues and, and to communicate with people. For most people, I think their sort of access point to the legal system uh, is, is often a lawyer. So we rely on the law schools and law professors to prepare qualified professionals who you know, have a, a great sense of justice and a great sense of mission and, and want to fulfill that and make society better. And are you confident with the reactions that you've had from your colleagues that they are up to the task of, <laughs> of doing this kind oh, of work? Oh, you know, it's amazing. I, as I mentioned earlier, I graduated from an American law school and I took my first job in Japan and I, at that time, I had never heard of the American Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. I learned about it from Japanese lawyers and Japanese scholars. Uh, and there are still, uh, you know, those people are still there doing good work and trying to demand government transparency, but there are, um, there are not enough of them. I mean, this kind of work does not generate any income. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really a, a contribution to society. And so it, it's just very difficult to attract a lot of people to work, to do this kind of work. That's right. There's really no client with significant capital or funds to make this profitable for a lawyer. So what is the lawyer's investment in this? I think the Japanese bar, on average, has a really, it's not every individual, but has a really rich engagement with the missions of liberty and justice. It's the title of the Bar Association's magazine, Jiuto Segi, Liberty and Justice. And I think the ethos of lawyers in Japan remains very, very high and impressive to both of us constantly. And litigation has been incredibly important in Japan. Not only litigation that wins the case, but when litigation can lose and still have an enormous role in shaping public awareness and moving things along in a good way. So to a certain degree, watching the lawyers and watching the litigation has been one of the bright spots for me and I think that will continue as the Constitution becomes these issues relating to constitutional they will be challenged in the courts they may or may not succeed but that helps create a public awareness of these things as being important. Now Mark your spectrum of uh, scholarship and teaching is quite broad you've taught and written about things uh, as far-reaching as tobacco control in Japan and the United States and even at the University of Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and you've also done Japanese business law. So how are you preparing your students to go over to Japan and be the kind of lawyers that uh, Larry Rapetta is talking about? I think the most important thing for my students, for our students, um, is an awareness of differences and being a bridge. Uh, so when an American lawyer meets a Japanese lawyer, they might s both speak English, mm -hmm. but when they use the word lawyer, when they use the word judge, when they use the word court, they may be imagining different things. I want my students to understand what the Japanese person that they're speaking to is understanding with that. Um, and it needs to be a mutual respect. So there are lessons that we can learn from Japan, fundamental, important lessons that we can learn from Japan of better ways to do things in a legal system, 
just as there are lessons that Japan can learn from us. And so I think, speaking for myself and I'm guessing for Professor Ropetta, that's been one of the re most rewarding parts of the, my career so far. And I want that capacity to be built up in my students and then for them to go on and do that. And as a follow-up question, how many students have you actually exported to Japan to do this work? We had a Richardson in Japan party uh, <laughs> gathering uh, two summers ago with about 35 people there. Um, so uh, of our graduates and uh, long-standing friends, uh, we're developing a footprint there. And just the same, Richardson graduates who are here in Honolulu or elsewhere um, with Japan capacities, um, but not necessarily in Japan doing that work. And you do this work as part of the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law Pacific Asian Legal Studies I do. program. Can you talk a little bit about that program before we go on break? So the, the Richardson School, part of its mission from the start has been uh, focused on Pacific Asia relations uh, in the legal training. Uh, and we are, we think we are the only law school in the United States with full-time language capable for their research specialists in Korean law, Japanese law, Chinese law, and in fact, we, the Philip law of the Philippines. Um, so we are very Asia capable. And one of the things that I say to my students is it's not enough to be siloed into an Asian nation in your knowledge, as may have been fine for my career, but I think our students need to have a cross-Asian awareness, and we can do that. And we actually are starting a program in ASEAN integration That's and right. uh, legal harmonization, and so exactly what the PALS program is doing is going to assist in that effort. That's right. We are expanding down into the uh, parts of South Asia uh, and Southeast Asia where we have not yet had a, a connections to, um, but we will not be letting go of East Asia. We're just building out. Building out. And Larry, is there a similar program at Meiji in Tokyo? Yes, there's uh, quite a bit of um, you know, work being done to provide more opportunities for Japanese students to get international exposure. So there's a called the Global 30 program. The government has invested money in establishing special programs. At our school, we've had for a number of years uh, a program where our students go to Cambridge, England mm. uh, to spend a little time studying. Terrific try to prepare them before they go and see what they've learned when they come back. So and to, mm -hmm. to credit Meiji, they mm -hmm. hired Professor Rapetta. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, the <laughs> chance to take a class with him and mm -hmm. to get his insights will broaden those students' uh, futures uh, greatly. Well, you're definitely both paying it forward as, as it concerns awareness of issues in Japan. Uh, when we come back from break, maybe we can talk about how the work that you're doing impacts us locally here in Hawaii. I know that uh, we, during the tsunami, the tsunami, those in Hawaii took a serious interest in assisting uh, Japan, the individuals as well as the government. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that when we come back. I have. Professor Mark Levin as my guest. He is a professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law and Professor Lawrence Rapetta from Meiji University in Tokyo. I'm Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law on the ThinkTech Live Network streaming series. We'll be back after this break.
Welcome back. My name is Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. My guests today are Professor Mark Levin from the William S. Richardson School of Law and Professor Larry Rapetta from Meiji University in Tokyo. So we're going to come back and we're going to start talking about the importance of the topics we have been addressing to right here at home in Hawaii. So many people, particularly everyday local people, felt the harm that was visited on Japan with the tsunami. Um, what were some of the things that were happening here to try to assist in volunteer efforts, relief efforts, but also if you know of any, any legal efforts to assist those who were obviously victim to this tragedy? Well, I can brag about my wife who put together a garage <laughs> sale with probably 50 women mm -hmm. gathering materials and raised uh, thousands of dollars mm -hmm. from this huge garage sale, uh, two years running. Um, it was a lot of work, but it really got some money raised uh, for Tohoku. I think there's no place in the United States where people have a more close connection and understanding to Japan. We are with Japanese people every day, mm -hmm. wherever we are in the, the islands. And people are aware of that and feel that uh, Japanese people, both people of Japanese ancestry, of course, is one third of the state's population, but also the, the visitor uh, and the long-term residents. Right. And so as a result, people in Hawaii recognize how important Japan is. Japan is quite important to our economy, it's very important to our culture, but there's also some nexus between the two governments and I'd like to really focus in on that nexus and that's the military engagement and participation between the two nations. We're very strong uh, in our partnership uh, ever since war the end of World War II, we've been very strong in our partnership with the government of Japan. Can we talk a little bit about that? Well, it's now 2014. Um, World War II came to an end in 1945. So uh, we've been going almost 70 years since then. Uh, and today, the United States maintains a number of very large military bases in Japan. Um, about two-thirds of the American presence is in Okinawa. Um, Okinawa, if, you know, I recommend they should visit Okinawa. I've never it's been a very there. beautiful place, much, <laughs> li much like Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Lovely beaches, subtropical climate. And I understand it's much nicer than Nagoya. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you can have a good time yeah. in Nagoya, too. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, Okinawa is really a very wonderful place to visit. Um, the main island, Okinawa Island, about Almost 20% of the land area is still uh, covered by U.S. military bases. Uh, the most infamous of those is a, is a Marine Corps um, air base called Fudemma, which is in the center of very heavily populated areas. So the people who live there uh, must endure you know, noise from uh, aircraft landings and takeoffs and a lot of other uh, impacts from the, uh, the big military presence. Um, currently, um, a big issue in Japan concerns the plans to build a new uh, Marine Corps air station in northern Okinawa at a place called Henoko. And if it's built, the plan is to um, construct an 1800 meter runway out into a bay, a beautiful, uh, pristine uh, bay, a subtropical bay with endangered species, mm -hmm. including turtles and uh, kind of a local manatee, mm -hmm. they're called the dugong. To put that into Hawaii terms, imagine the reef runway that we have at Honolulu Airport right. being constructed in perhaps the most beautiful waters off of uh, Maui. Right. And you realize that this perfect tropical waters mm -hmm. are becoming a runway. Mm -hmm. It's environmentally devastating. And so tell us a little bit more about these plans. So the plans have been in place for a very long time. Uh, the Okinawan people have resisted uh, strenuously. Uh, there have been lots of demonstrations. The o Okinawan Prefectural Assembly has voted unanimously to oppose the construction of any new American military bases uh, in Okinawa. Um, however, um, 
on the other side, the U.S. government um, really wants this uh, facility built. It's backed by the Japanese national government. Mm -hmm. So on one side you have the two national governments, on the other side you have the Okinawan people. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, while we have tight relationships between the Japanese and the U.S. government, the Okinawan people are going to feel the brunt of this proposed project. So you have outlined the, some of the disadvantages of this project. Are there any advantages? Well, to the extent you believe that um, the United States military requires a, a bigger presence or a more permanent presence or an upgraded presence uh, on Japanese territory, then of course you think that building new military stations there is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And that idea, I think that is the U.S. government's position. Um, and the relationship between the two countries, you know, from the American side of the table, clearly the strongest voice comes from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the biggest interest of the U.S. government in Japan is to maintain its military facilities. And just to, to, as a way of demonstrating the U.S. government's uh, emphatic uh, commitment to seeing this happen, mm -hmm. When President Obama was elected and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, her f was, she became Secretary of State, her first trip abroad was to Japan. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, I believe, pretty clearly, was to make clear that the U.S.'s position with regards to the base in Okinawa was unchanged from the Bush from the prior years. Mm -hmm. So there's, this is something that is core to the U.S. government's positions, regardless of which administration, regardless of which party is in power. So this seems as though a strategy has already been put in place, even though we've heard notions that there would be a drawdown there and that uh, troops and units would be moving back to Guam. So this is something a little bit different. There has been a discussion about moving troops to Guam. Uh, I don't think any concrete steps have been taken yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think the U.S. Congress has funded um, any of those activities yet. There is a plan. Uh, this is another plan. So even though US, some U.S. military forces might move to Guam, they want to build the new uh, air facility anyway. So let's connect the dots then. <laughs> Many of the issues that arise because of this potential strategic plan to build these new marine bases, these are critical issues that should come out in, in information from the government to its citizens. The secrecy law then in Japan could actually put a, a stop to the flow of that information. There's no question. So the, many people have pointed out that one application of the new secrecy law may be to designate uh, many activities of the Japanese government related to planning new bases, re related to supporting new bases and otherwise could be designated secret and could be off the table. Uh, news reporters who may want to investigate those issues, clearly issues of great national importance, may potentially be threatened with criminal prosecution uh, should they be too aggressive. And, and we want reporters to be, it's called investigative journalism. Right. Reporters are supposed to be aggressive. aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, ag again, with this new law in place, they potentially could come into contact with information that might have been made secret. They could potentially be subject to prosecution. And the same dots get connected with nuclear power. Okay. So the Japanese nuclear power sure. industry law has a provision explicitly noting that the nuclear power industry in Japan is a matter of national security. Mm -hmm. So that's already in the nuclear power law. When you have that in that law, and then you put it together with a state secrecy law, you now have matters where, similarly, investigative reporting with regards to nuclear power construction, safety, or the dismantling mm -hmm. of, of the plants that melted down, mm -hmm. any of that could also subject a reporter to criminal penalties and giving them reason to hold back rather than investigate. That's why many of us were really disappointed about the position taken by the United States government uh, regarding the secrecy bill. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government for years has been pressuring Japan to adopt stronger secrecy protection, protections and stronger means heavier criminal penalties. Right. So now uh, some uh, a government official who leaks information is subject to potentially 10 years in jail. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, I believe mm -hmm. that the Central American policy, the Central American message to the world is that we want to promote democracy, we want to promote citizen engagement, we want to promote people knowing about what their government's doing. The secrecy law is precisely pushing the ball in the wrong direction. In the exact opposite direction. That's right. Yeah. So it, it seems that we've connected some really instrumental dots. Are there third tier or fourth tier effects that this secrecy law will also have? I, I'm thinking as you're speaking, obviously the chilling effect on investigative journalism could be an overarching uh, result. But uh, are there other areas where such a chilling effect will have really tragic results? Well, we just saw an example with the nuclear disaster of 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Japan built 54 nuclear power reactors. Over the years, it was recognized that some of them are in dangerous locations, mm -hmm. subject to tsunami damage. Mm -hmm. You know, the northeastern coast of Japan has been experiencing tsunamis every 50 or 60 years mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. The risk was always there. Uh, the government concealed uh, this risk. Uh, when, when the issue was raised, it was hidden. Um, so that's just one example of the threat to public health that exists when government is not held accountable. And people should, people should have a right to know this as they are directly impacted by the harm. So we have the nuclear reactor creating dangerous conditions for individuals. Let's take it back to the title of today's discussion, mm -hmm. the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So all of this factors back into that entire dynamic, which is to say that Japan leaders are now pushing the country towards radical revision of the Constitution. That requires public debate, discussion, and the public to be informed. So what you have is a leadership that is pushing towards constitutional reform on the one hand, but pulling back the capacity of the people to be informed and to discuss it freely, mm -hmm. in which case the possibility of a constitutional change that really isn't supported by the people uh, becomes realistic and frightening depending on what the terms of that constitution would be. And I think we mentioned as we were discussing off air, and I want to see if we can can expand that discussion, that the, the current disasters had to be dealt with by a government that wasn't even responsible for many of the construction of these plans. And so how does that factor into exactly what you're saying about the balance of power? Yeah, this is a great irony of Japanese history mm -hmm. that the, the Liberal Democratic Party has been the dominant uh, political party in Japan since it was founded in the middle 1950s. Which is neither liberal nor democratic. <laughs> <laughs> it's neither liberal nor democratic. It's a very nationalistic party. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it was under the uh, control, when the government was under the control of the LDP, that the nuclear power industry was launched in the 1970s, and we had this huge nuclear power industry built. Um, but then, when the great disaster occurred in 2011, the LDP happened to be out of power. It was the opposition party called the Democratic Party of Japan that was in office at that time, and they had to deal with the chaos that resulted from three nuclear meltdowns, evacuation of tens of thousands of people, the horrendous damage from the tsunami. So they were inevitably criticized on every front. So they bore the brunt of the... The Prime Minister at the time was a progressive lawyer who had done many really groundbreaking things up through then into his career. And suddenly he's got this on his hands, and anybody would have been struggling to deal with the circumstances and make it the best, and anyone would be dropping some balls and having some sure. faults happening uh, on their watch. Um, but that really, for the most part, closed out the, his career as a politician from there forward. And proceeds to make the LDP now a revitalized, yeah. uh, a revitalized party. That's right, and just to repeat what we said earlier, the current prime minister is a vigorous, 
a man who very effectively is able to manage the news media. He has a clear program, and not only the constitutional program we've talked about, but also an economic program. Uh, soon after he took office, the value of the yen dropped by actually 25 percent. Let's Huge talk impact about this the after the economy. break. So we're going to talk about the economic impact of his strategy. You're watching Life in the Law. I'm Danielle Conway. My guests are Mark Levin from the William S. Richardson School of Law and Lawrence Rapetta from Meiji University in Tokyo. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Bye. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. I'm Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network Streaming Series. My guests are Professor Mark Levin from the William S. Richardson School of Law and Professor Lawrence Rapetta from Meiji University. So we touched on briefly, and I want to get back to the economic program that Prime Minister Abe is putting into effect. And, and you're telling me during the break that this economic program is actually making him a very popular leader. That's right. Um, I think voters in Japan, voters in the United States, most places in the world, I mean, the first issue on their minds are, are economic issues, or jobs, and supporting their families. And the, um, the, the Japanese economy has had weak growth for two decades now, more than two decades. Um, Mr. Abe was able to come with a new economic plan. Um, uh, he appointed a new uh, governor of the Bank of Japan, which uh, produced a lot of money, flooded the economy with money, resulting in a decline in the value of the yen against the U.S. dollar by as much as 25 percent. Uh, and so there was a lot of excitement about that, a lot of belief that this was this is a new uh, economic day and there will be many opportunities. So this newfound popularity for Prime Minister Abe means that laws like the secrecy bill will or may have the impact of coming into fruition, being successful, and then putting forth his other platform, which is a very conservative platform. That's exactly right. He came into power, Japan has two houses of its parliament, as we do, and he came into power with only power, control over one of those two houses. So he couldn't run the show completely without getting the second one. The second election was last summer, and so he really needed to make sure that he could, his party could take control of the upper house. So Abenomics was put into place, and this boost in popularity based on economic support is what worked to get his party control of the upper house. Now the Abe administration has control over both houses until the next round of elections come down a few years from now. And whether he is popular or not, aside from street demonstrations, the political power and the legislature is in his hands. That is a great deal of power, especially for a very conservative leader with, right. with a strategy. <laughs> he has a very defined strategy. So why don't we talk uh, in the program with a talk about or a summary of that strategy and what others who might oppose him are trying to do to counterbalance that. Well, it's, it's a tough struggle from the other side because, uh, as Professor Levin pointed out, um, Mr. Abe and his party do have control of both houses of the national parliament. Uh, no elections will be required again until 2016. Mm. And so he's in a very, very strong position. Um, we will see additional initiatives uh, by the Abe administration. The, the next one that we expect is a reinterpretation of Article 9 of the Constitution. Uh, Article 9 is the, the pacifist clause, mm -hmm. which says that Japan will not use uh, violence in solving international mm -hmm. disputes mm -hmm. and prohibits the maintenance of a military. Mm -hmm. um, so we believe that the Abe administration will reinterpret uh, that clause because it's, it's very difficult to change the Constitution itself. Right. They will reinterpret the clause to say that Japan will be able to 
engage in what they call um, self-defense you know, together with allies. Well, we have a lot to look forward to, and I think you must return as a guest on Life and the Law. We have to wrap it up now. My guests have been Professor Mark Levin from the University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law, and Professor Lawrence Repetta from Meiji University in Tokyo, talking about Japan's constitution in the 21st century. Thank you for watching. <laughs>